And here we go. All right, welcome everyone uh, to the May 14th, 2024 Akapaya user group meeting. Um, this is a Hyperledger call. Uh, so as always, the antitrust policy is in effect. Uh, also, please abide by the Hyperledger code of conduct. Um, I'm Daniel Bloom. Steven usually hosts this call, but he's uh, joining us today, but is at an airport, so is unable to uh, to host and lead the call today. So I am step stepping in to help out. Um, let's see. Uh, are there any? Is there anyone new on the call today that would like to speak up and introduce themselves? Looking at the group, I think I recognize most everybody that's here today, but I'll I'll be quiet for a minute, see if anybody would like to uh, introduce themselves, talk a little bit about what they're working on. Okay. Uh, is there any announcements before we go any further? I believe EIC is coming up here pretty soon. Uh, there's several from the community that will be attending that. Um, I don't remember the exact dates, so I'll have to go and look those up to put those down. Uh, but yeah, if you're going to EIC, um, I know Sam Kern and Steve McCown are planning to have a session about post-quantum crypto and verifiable credentials in Didcom, so that'll be cool. Uh, Patrick, you got your hand up? What is EIC? European Identity Conference, I believe, is what that stands for. It's being held in Berlin this year. Ah, yes. Okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I think I've heard of it. Yep. Cool. Okay. With that, we'll go ahead and uh, jump into our agenda for today. Um, so we got first here lined up uh, Wade to talk about uh, new GitHub Actions to update GitHub Actions. Um, would you like the screen share for that one, Wade, or? Yeah, sure, probably. Cool. Probably hope. Um, that screen right there. Okay, so the PR that we're talking about is this one here. Um, all of the links are in the, the wiki already, but I'll just fire them in here as I go through it. So um, what we've done is, um, a lot of this, uh, we need to give credit to Mortis Beer. He gave us uh, sort of the, the push on this to, to start with. And that's sort of where this um, GitHub Actions uh, update came from, uh, this initial one. And we kind of took it from there and, and went further with it. But basically what we're doing is um, we're configuring Dependabot, which is sort of built into GitHub. And you have the... Most people know Dependabot for being able to um, uh, submit PRs uh, for uh, security vulnerabilities and, and various things like that. Um, you can take it one step further and you can get it to uh, manage your dependency updates so it can scan your uh, repository um, on a, you know, a regularly or scheduled basis um, to look for um, updates to your dependencies. And there's various control over that. Um, so that's sort of what this PR does is it adds, adds that um, capability. So um, what we've done here is with GitHub Actions is uh, this was already um, in. So some of you may have seen this. Basically what it does is it looks at all of the uh, workflow, uh, GitHub Actions workflows and updates any of the GitHub Actions that are in there, groups them all together. Um, into, into one update PR. Um, these other sections here were doing updates to PIP. Um, so wanted to talk about some capabilities and limitations of, uh, of this right away. So um, one of the things that we see here is we see a lot of uh, replication. Uh, so we see ecosystem PIP uh, under the directory. One of the things that you need to do with Dependabot is you need to actually tell it uh, where the uh, dependency manifests are explicitly. Uh, Wait. Full, sorry. Yeah, go ahead. Should we be seeing your screen? Uh, yeah, you should be seeing my screen. No, Let's no, try no. that. There we go. Can you see my screen now? 
Yep, we're good. Thanks. I'm good. Okay. Yep. Great. Okay. So, uh, like I was saying, one of the things that you'll see here is you'll see a lot of duplication because you need to explicitly tell um, depend about what folder the dependency uh, manifests live in. So you can see we've got dependency manifests at the root level, de demo level, demo level in various places. Um, so that's sort of one one limitation. Another limitation is it's pretty good at, at updating most of the dependencies, but at this point in time, it doesn't have support for um, Docker Compose files. It'll do Docker files, but not the Docker Compose files. So that's a bit of a limitation. There is a long-standing open PR to, to resolve that issue. So hopefully at some point they, they deal with that. Um, so basically what we can, uh, the other thing that we can do is um, we can maintain our uh, Docker files as well as um, uh, NPM dependencies, various things in other uh, repositories and also the dev container configuration for it. So that's basically what it does. What we've done here is we've done a schedule um, weekly um, what we're finding with some of the repositories, such as um, the Akapai plugins, uh, it's set to daily um, and it creates uh, a large quantity of update noise. Um, so that's another thing that we wanted to, to talk, uh, talk about. Um, so what, what we would expect from this is we would expect that once we... Um, merge this PR that we would see a lot of um, dependabot updates uh, PRs uh, being fired at the repository. The way it's configured right now is we can see with this particular one, we're grouping all the all of the updates together into one PR. Um, you don't see that same configuration in these other ones. And what ends up happening there is it dependabot by default will uh, submit a separate PR for each dependency that it does the update. So that's another thing that we want to maybe touch on with this feedback that we've got. Um, reasoning behind ignoring uh, versions. So one of the things that we've talked about when we started doing this on BC Gov repositories is um, we, for NPM, uh, so for TypeScript and JavaScript packages were ignoring uh, major versions as well as patch versions just to keep down the, the patch versions more to keep down the update noise, major versions to um, uh, ignoring the major versions to try and stop breaking changes or you know not introduce any breaking changes. So that's what we're doing there. Uh, one of the questions that we've had from a bunch of different developers, we've had feedback from Morris Beers as well as uh, Timo um, about whether, you know, what should we be ignoring and whether it's a good idea to ignore major versions. Um, patch, ignoring patch versions seems to, to, to be a um, uh, consistent. Um, but that's, you know, something that we might want to discuss is what, what we should and shouldn't be, um, uh, ignoring, uh, grouping. Um, so obviously if Dependabot is firing off a, uh, PR for each individual update that it does, that's a lot of PRs to deal with. Um, they can be grouped together. There's settings for that. Um, there's advantages and disadvantages to both. Um, I've heard from developers that if you group them together, you're more likely to, to introduce breaking changes to the PR, um, but then having them separate um, provides you more flexibility with which ones you want to address, but also comes with the overhead of having like, you know, uh, a lot, uh, you know, higher PR volume. Um, there's some strategies to dealing with the dependabot PRs. Um, Lucas O'Neill from our team uh, with the NPM dependencies in traction. What he does is he uses the the um, <clears throat> the dependabot PRs as both a trigger and a guide to to what updates need to be done. And then what he does is he goes through and does 
APR um, that updates that that he goes through and updates the packages all together, um, bundling the changes, you know, the various changes together and and excluding ones that cause issues, and then um, once that's merged, what that ends up having the effect that that ends up having is. Dependabot reevaluates all of its PRs and closes the ones that are no longer necessary. So that's that's one way to deal with the the PR volume in um, with the individual ones as, as uh, opposed to the grouping together. Um, so feedback that we've got uh, on this particular PR uh, from Morris. Um, dealing so dealing with parameterized docker files so one of the things uh, that we have is we have some docker files that have uh, arguments and then they have the versions with them i think in this case i i don't know for sure but i don't think dependabot can deal with that um, so those particular docker files would get completely ignored um, those would have to be updated and, and done manually um, he's got some recommendations here about um, removing um, duplication of uh, common code using uh, YAML anchors, which is interesting. Um, so we could use that for ignore sections and schedule sections and various things like that. Um, so I think that might be a good idea. Um, uh, again, he's pointed out, you know, what do we really want to ignore? Do we want to ignore, do we really want to ignore major versions or, or you know, do we want to include them and, and just deal with the, the things as they come up? Uh, what else we got? Um, ignoring patch releases to reduce spam. I mean, that's, that's one thing that's indicated here. Uh, Common update schedules uh, impacting specifically something like uh, Akapai, if it's running integration tests on the PR. I mean, if we have the common schedule for like, you know, weekly Monday, um, then we could uh, get a very large number of, of uh, actions going off and trying to run uh, integration tests all at the same time, which could uh, be a messy situation. So, uh, he had talked about spreading it out a little bit more, uh, interested in people's feedback on that. Uh, he also in, uh, brought up the uh, options, the additional options for um, commit message prefixes. Uh, the labels that he did here, we get those for free, so we don't need to do that, but the, uh, we might want to prefix commit messages. Um, so, and then we go over to Timo um, provided some feedback, uh, a couple of pieces of feedback here that are sort of important, you know, whether or not we want to, because of the volume, whether or not we want to deal with it via grouping or deal with it via like, you know, a, um, a strategy, a different strategy, like I recommend you was talking uh, about what Lucas does. Um, and then also, um, it, uh, noise with dev dependencies. So it looks like we are able to control that um, in the configuration. So what we could do is we could ignore anything that is not a production level uh, dependency update and just ignore the uh, dev dependencies, which um, as Timo says, don't necessarily add uh, any value to, to what's happening. Um, so, I mean, in a, in a nutshell and really quickly, that's sort of um, what I wanted to cover. So kind of would like to get people's, open it up and get people's feedback on, on what they'd like to see or, you know, they think this is a good idea, a bad idea um, or what. Uh, we've got a hand up from uh, pretty. would you like to go ahead, pretty? Yeah, uh, thanks, Daniel. Uh, hi, Wade. Uh, so continuing our previous conversation on the SNIKE scanning, right? So I just wanted to ask, like, where is that uh, uh, SNIKE uh, container scanning? So uh, is it happening? Uh, and what is this uh, Dependabots uh, doing on the container scanning front? 
uh, the Dependabot side of things doesn't have anything to do with the container scanning. It's it's strictly it strictly deals with um, with dependency updates uh, in any dependency manifest, like your your uh, your um, pip uh, requirements files, your uh, pi project files, uh, your project tomls, you know that sort of stuff. It handles all the stuff before the container build even happens. Yeah, exactly. So I mean, it it will address, um, you know, having 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 everything up to date um, mm -hmm. is going to help the containers. You know, the container scanning, you know, pass you know pass its its checks and stuff like that. But it doesn't deal with it. And um, regarding the the scanning itself i haven't been able i haven't had a chance to really dig into that to see exactly why we're not getting uh any reports on it it seems like it's running but um, yeah. we're not getting the reports aren't showing up yeah that is one point and uh regarding the container scanning um i guess it's doing the same thing right so once uh, the container is uh, scanned so it's going to scan the dependencies in, inside the image and then see what is, uh, uh, what are the, it is going to do the same thing uh, which this dependabot is doing, isn't it? The snake scan. Mm, no, the different. two are different. So the container scanning will uh, indicate vulnerabilities, but it won't uh, submit PRs against, uh, you know, how to fix those vulnerabilities. It only identifies them where this is dealing with dependence the dependency updates so let's say let's say well dependabot dependabot on its own if there's a security uh if there's a a release of a particular uh python module let's say um that deals with this particular security issue by default um dependabot will go through all the different repositories provided you have you know the alerting um the notification set up for it, and we'll submit PRs to update your packages to to um, deal with those vulnerabilities. This takes it one step further, and basically every time a new release of a package comes out, it basically looks at that new version of the package, looks at what your what you have as as far as your dependencies dependencies goes, and then um, recommends updating to to a newer version of a, of a particular package so this um what we're talking about here as far as the configuration goes is proactively um looking for update paths within the dependencies for the project rather than than reactively dealing with um with security issues as they come out you still get the security issues um, the, the security uh, scanning and everything from Dependabot and, and those patches that fix those security vulnerabilities um, are over and above this configuration, but this one just makes sure that we're retro, you know, that we're proactively keeping things up to date. Got it, got it, yeah. So um, this is uh, in relation to the same thing um, which we are doing. So uh, we are doing the uh, quality scanning, uh, right? So the images which are being used are uh, uh, being scanned with Qualys in our DevOps pipeline. And then uh, we are uh, checking for vulnerabilities and fixing whichever is uh, doing it. So the problem is we are using the not the latest images, but the one image before this. For example, if point 0.12 is uh, released currently, we are in point 0.11, right? So that image, if there is any vulnerability, so that uh, how will it be fixed? Uh, so is there any plan to uh, scan like all the previous images or at least the supported images or the releases uh, by this Dependabot? Will this, will it scan that or? Uh... Dependabot, Dependabot will look at updates yeah. to Docker files and yeah. recommend updates to the Docker files that it can, that it can deal with. But Dependabot doesn't scan the images itself. That's that's like for a tool like Wallace or or Snake to do. Snake does it scan the uh, releases? The Snake scanning tool. Sorry, it doesn't scan the releases. Uh, does it scan the previous releases? I mean, it sc scans the latest releases, right? So I I haven't looked at the I haven't looked deep into that side of stuff yet. That's okay. kind of a separate topic. Got it. Okay. Sounds good. 
Yeah, so I'll uh, take that with you uh, separately then. So that's it from my side. Thanks. So a, a brief comment on the whole Dependabot thing. Uh, I also was spurred into uh, uh, applying the Dependabot config on a few of the repos that I maintain by Maritz. And uh, it's it's helpful in the sense that I'm, I'm more aware of um, you know when those dependencies are starting to get more stale, but it is certainly a little overwhelming to have it be on every single update. Um, so certainly uh, I would agree that not having the patch releases be included in that, um, that would probably help out a lot. And that's probably something I should apply to the repos that I um, have applied those configurations to. Um, the The other thing that I, I that came to mind while you're talking about uh, some of Timo's comments though, was um, if we omit the development dependencies altogether, um, uh, I, I would be afraid of at least I'm not sure that this would actually come to fruition, but I would I would be a little afraid of when it comes time to like update our Python version, for instance. Um, we're gonna be on some super old version of you know PyTest or something like that. And uh, you know, when we go to update to the new version, we're on a version of PyTest that's so old that we're unable to uh, update all at once. And then we have to go and handle this whole backlog of like um, small updates that occurred to tests. We had a similar scenario happen with like async test, uh, which was a dependency we used to use, um, was no longer maintained and no longer necessary even when we made the jump from 3.7 to 3.9. Uh, and that was a, a fairly involved change for, for our code base. Um, so I, I'm not sure what the happy medium between omitting them entirely and uh, keeping on top of some of the development dependencies at, at some cadence might be beneficial still, I guess. Um, but uh, yeah, I would certainly say we don't need to be aware of every patch release for dev dependencies that comes out. This is great. Yeah, let's see. Uh, any other comments or questions for Wade? Cool. Uh, so if we, if there are other comments or or things people would like to raise, I I take it the uh, pull request to twenty nine forty five is the place to go and and make those comments. Yes, please, if anybody's got any opinions or comments, questions, concerns, So are you waiting for opinion or for people to wait in on something right now that's blocking this from moving forward? Like you mentioned, like a strategy around grouping, like is there a decision that has to be made before this moves forward? No, I mean, the way it is now, we can we could merge it the way it is now. Um, one of the things that we wanted to do was make sure that um, if we do merge it in its current format and we, you know, make changes to it, you know, improvements to it um, as we go, uh, we just wanted to make everybody aware that there's going to be a large number of, of PRs that uh, get fired against the repository. And there are some, you know, some ways that we can either deal with that through dependent bot or through just um, str uh, update strategies, um, separate update strategies. Okay. So maybe I'll make some comments to that effect on the PR and then we can go from there, but there's no real reason why we couldn't uh, merge it. We've merged, uh, similar PRs have been merged on several other repositories and that's kind of where we're getting some of this feedback from is it's a heck of a lot easier to see it in practice. Go ahead, Pradeep. Yeah, so um, this is a question to Wade or um, like others who are maintaining this. So there was a latest release with the patch on point one one, right? So they've identified the vulnerability from AIO HTTP library. 
So just wanted to know like uh, where this um, uh, was reported and how uh, it was fixed. I mean, uh, we, I know how it was fixed, but how did, um, uh, where was this notification coming from or uh, which tool identified this vulnerability? The Pandabot uh, found that, that that goes through the standard security, um, the Pandabot security vulnerability alerts and code scanning that happens all the time. So once the patch was uh, for that was fixed, um, it was uh, there's a PR against it from Dependabot. Okay, so the Dependabot does uh, scan the previous ones or uh... it scans the code. It's not scanning the containers. Got it. Okay, so this one was already fixed in point one two, and just wanted to understand that. Yeah, so the 0.11.1 release that we put out, um, that was us as maintainers uh, looking back at the previous release and saying that this existed in this release as well. And it's likely that people are still on this release, so we'll go ahead and emit a, a patch. So people who are still on the 0.11 release would be able to uh, take care of that. Got it, understood. All right. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you for clarification. Yeah. Yep. Cool. Uh, anything else for Wade? Okay. Thanks, Wade. Um, it's good to stay on top of the dependencies and stuff. So I'm uh, excited to have that on Akapai as well, having some of those other things. Um, we've been getting them to the main project, uh, but some of the others uh, sides would be helpful for sure. Um, okay, so next thing on our agenda we've got lined up is uh, update merge planning, um, upgrades to various pipeline components. I think the uh, Dependabot stuff is related to that. Um, I had a tab opened up here. Um, upgrading linting, upgrading testing, uh, some dependency updates from Maritz again here. Um, so we've got a few things that we've already marked as uh, intending to get into the 1.0 release. Um, this dropping the NDSDK, a number of other PRs have been merged recently as well with the um, Anon Credits RS upgrade endpoint, um, as well as the VCDI attachment format for um, Anon Credits in W3C format. Um, those have been merged in. Um, and then we've got a number of other ones that have been opened up recently. So let's see. Uh, maybe I'll ask the question this way. Is there anything on this list that we should not have merged in before a 1.0 release? Uh, I think this extracts getting verification key proof signing one. This is an older one. Um, and then we assigned Patrick to that one. Um, yeah, sorry, I haven't had time to review. Uh, that is fine if it's not in 1.0, uh, yeah. according to me. I don't think it needs to be. Got it. Yeah, that's what I figured with the age on that one. Um, okay. Uh, a non creds migration guide. Um, I'm guessing that's probably a, a 1.0 include one as well, um, along with the other non creds sinful registry list. Yes. Uh, I'll go ahead. I can uh, I can apply labels from this view. Let's go back. One oh. oh, that took a minute. Okay. Uh, the pydantic update. I think this one is no longer blocked. It can probably come out of draft. Um, there has been a release of the pydid library, so that should be ready to go. Uh, the AIO HTTP API spec update. This one's in a little bit of an unclear state to me. Uh, there was some back and forth. Um, still have an integration test failure. Um, the AIO HTTP API spec dependency is no longer being maintained. Um, and there are some things that are preventing uh, using Python 3.12 as a result of it being on older versions of certain dependencies. Um, 
So Marie's put together uh, uh, just a fork uh, of the project that includes some of those dependency updates that enables it to move on to a Python 3.12 release. Um, so we, we've got queued up some discussion on ideas that we want to uh, do some technical debt elimination in order to before the 1.0 release. Um, so that might be something that would fall into that category. Uh, Akif. Hey, yeah, sorry, I haven't looked at the discussion, but what's the long-term plan like to to migrate off of using AIO um, API spec? Yeah, that's an excellent question. Um, the proposal from Maritz here, I think is essentially, um, it's not changing anyways. Um, so he just did a quick fork and then update and tagged to just do the minimum amount of effort required in order to get it functioning again for a newer version of Python 3.12. Um, I don't think there's been any discussion yet to this point on how we would go about potentially replacing the API spec library or the AIO HTTP API spec library. Yeah, I would assume that it would be a quite a big effort. Right. Because we'd have to basically update every route. Yeah, exactly. A route handler. Yeah. Um, for those who aren't immediately familiar with this library, this is what provides us with the decorators for um, the AI AIO HTTP endpoints that enable us to generate an OPA, open API specification um, from the, the code itself. Uh, Patrick. So if I understand here, the AIO HTTP API spec has been forked and we now live on this fork. Uh, uh, if we merge this PR, we would be on this fork. As it stands, we're, we're using the official version uh, still. Is that good? I mean, it's unmaintained. Um, right. And right. That becomes okay. an issue once we move on to uh, other Python versions. Okay, so um, the IO HTTP API spec is an unmaintained project currently? Yeah. Correct. Right. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah, I see the, the problem. Yeah. Indeed. Um, Yeah, uh, replacing this library would be painful. Um, we've done painful things in the past before in the project when it's been necessary, so it's not impossible by any means, but I, I think we'll have to probably do a little bit more investigation on this one and figure out what the balance is in terms of, of cost and benefit, I suppose. Is there, so AIOHTTP and the AIOHTTP API spec are two different things. The AIO HTTP takes care of all the functional API and the API spec is just, this is just what gives us this SWAT, this open API documentation page, right? Right, I think so, yeah. Uh, have we looked, since this is unmaintained, well, first of all, is AIO HTTP still maintained? Uh, AIO HTTP itself is actively maintained. Okay. And is there um, so like the, this is uh, this is a library that is companion to AIO HTTP as a server that enables Open API spec stuff. Okay, and there's no alternative. This is the only only AIO HTTP like companion project that does this. There's no. Uh, um, I am not personally point. aware of any alternatives, but I also have done maybe yeah. a grand total of five minutes of investigation on that front. So. Yeah, oh, that's pretty good. All right, yeah, yeah. It might it might be worthwhile to add that as a action uh, item. But yeah. considering that this only really affects the Swagger documentation, it doesn't affect functionality, right? So I would say it's probably low risk, lower risk. Right. It's important for the demos and the stuff, like. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It's a, a more of a developer experience item as opposed to a, a production functionality issue, for sure. Okay, so yeah, that one needs a little bit more investigation, I think. Um, upgrade test dependencies, upgrade lint dependencies, uh, PyTest, uh, rough, I imagine, for those. Um, 
these I imagine are probably pretty easy merges. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, this one bears uh, some brief comment, uh, I think. Um, so recently we at Indicio were, were working with Credo and Akapai in terms of getting JSON LD credentials issued and presented. Uh, there were a number of challenges that were discovered as a result of that. Uh, the Credo 05 uh, release introduced some, well, okay. Maybe I should speak a little bit more cautiously. I'm not sure if it was broken at 05 or if it was at some point in the past, but uh, there is a, a library that was introduced for uh, presentation exchange handling, um, which has different expectations than uh, Akapai's implementation. Um, so this PR corrects that behavior. This is something that I would really like to see, make it into a 1.0 release, personally. Um, I'd like to have a look on there. Yeah, actually, that, that's a good point. Um, I meant to tag you in this as well, uh, since you've been particularly on uh, Patrick's does here. What is your hand? Yeah, sh 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 I don't know. Sometimes I'm not showing up. I know like I'm on a brew or on the, another pull request, but I'm a bit confused about these adding reviewers uh, in this field sometime. I names don't show up but yeah if you just put me there i guess that's fine yeah yeah indeed can you quickly uh, go over like what kind of changes like is very like small details or okay yeah pretty small details just mostly validation issues uh for the most part there there are some things that had to be worked around in terms of what sorts of values we're including in the issued credential and the presentation itself and I can yeah. include some more details in the comments on that. Um, I can copy paste some things. Uh, but yeah, the only actual real changes here was no longer requiring uh, the presentation to have specifically UUID fields for IDs um, mm -hmm. and ignoring unknown attributes instead of raising an error when it encounters them. So, yeah. Uh, oh, and the, that the domain no longer has to be a URI. So those are. The yeah, I, there's a lot, I think there's another pull request about it, but everything that touches PyLD as a library, there's it adds some constraint on the input that you can put in IKPy that are not real. You know, there's just mm -hmm. the the PyLD yeah. library has some shortcomings. Uh, but I think there's another pull request I've seen uh, about replacing that library as a whole. So. Uh, pull request or was it, uh, let's see, an issue? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. This was one that I only just noticed as I was getting on the call. Um, it's one that Stephen added a link to, to the agenda. Um, so is, is interesting. Okay. Yeah. I know like the maintainers of PyLD, they, they want to get it you know, a bit more up to date and iron out these tests, but uh, these issues, but yeah. Yeah, okay. Interesting. Yeah, I'll have a look at the PR and the comment. Cool. Uh, the Dependabot PR we've talked about, uh, non-creds, I think this is related to this issue that was also linked in the agenda. Um, any comments to raise on this one, Jamie? Um, yeah, so basically revoking credentials didn't work properly with the non-creds, but it ended up being a very small fix. The A non-creds RS library uh, still expected, I don't know all the history, but apparently the very first credential is you can never revoke it and in Indy and a non creds RS still expected that first index to be in the list that you sent to it. And, uh, it was getting excluded when it was implemented. So all it had to do was include that first index when it was sending it to 
the known creds are yes. So it's it's a little weird because um a non creds RS still expects that index to be there even though it was like an indie thing, I yeah. think. So it ended up being a one line fix. It took me like two days to figure out what was going on. Doesn't doesn't it use that first index to calculate the the hash? Yeah, so that's why it wasn't working. Yeah. That that first index, it's not actually credential. It's an initializing record for the revocation registry. It's it's basically um, it's required to set up the revocation registry on the ledger, um, and it, it's basically just a. There's no credential associated to it. Yeah, so it's a little interesting because when we this is implemented, especially for legacy indie, but any other implementation that uses the library will still need the index. But anyway, it ended up being it. I'm pretty sure that's all it was. So. Interesting. Okay, and then we've got a documentation PR for the BCDI credentials. Cool. Um, there are a couple of other issues. We, we brought up two of them already. The other one was unit test coverage. Um, yeah, we used to get pretty in detail coverage reports through. Uh, we, we used an external tool for that for a while. Um, and then uh, I think Hyperledger requested that we focus on having GitHub Actions be the primary source for our, our pipeline. Um, and then we, we lost the test coverage reports. Um, I see, yeah, Jamie, I can... you've been assigned to that one. I had something working for a bit, and then uh, I kind of have to make it work for my fork repo and know exactly what the permissions are and then pass it on to... Uh, whoever has admin rights on the repo. So, but I'll be working on this again soon. Cool. Uh, the, the final one that's been noted here in the uh, technical debt elimination was uh, this discussion that we started up around uh, a formalized test plan. Um, I, I think this discussion largely remains in the same state that it was before where we decided that we, we basically just need a benevolent dictator to come in and say this is what we're we're going to pursue for for now and then we can try it out and see what works and what doesn't um i think there's definitely things in here that um would be helpful in preparing for a 1.0 release um some of those practices are probably a little bit more attainable than than others so I, that likely will be a bit of a pick and choose situation i imagine uh, in terms of how we go forward with that one. Okay, yeah, I think we... we still need to... Yeah. Uh, just we still need uh, to think about our plan. We definitely have to take action on it because there's quite a bit of stuff getting missed. And I find the integration tests like... They're good the way they are, but when you want to test something else, you have to go all into the back channel and demo. And sometimes it's really hard to make changes to test something that you want to test. It's like, I don't know what exactly yeah. to do, but it's it's pretty slow process when you want to add an integration test for like a different flow that's not already kind of tested um yeah. but i i just think a few of these things that came up in the last release we should be testing better with integration tests mostly yeah yeah for sure i don't know i just think we yeah we definitely need to keep taking action on that one there's a lot of conversation there but i think it's important yeah, so it's something that I've started doing, especially since uh, the, the last release where there were a number of issues that we 
should have caught sooner. And uh, fortunately, we had the the test harness that helped us to identify and catch a bunch of them. Um, but since that past release, I've been making more um, of an effort to test against uh, that. I've, I've got a minimal example repository that I created a while ago that we've been using a lot uh, at Indicio for just reproducing issues that we run on, run into and figuring out how we need to fix them. Um, and over time, we've just built up a, a small battery of examples of, of reproducible material. Um, and so I've just started running the release candidate through that full set uh, of examples. And that, and that was able to help catch the issue with the revocation notification, for instance, on the 0.12.1 release candidates. Um, uh, yeah, so I definitely agree. There's the integration tests. I've been working with Akapai for a number of years at this point, and the integration tests are still something that are foreign and a little bit unapproachable to me in the Akapai project. Um, so it's I find it easier to go to an external system where I can just put together a, a simple Docker Compose and run against it with uh, the controller setup that I have within that repo. Um, and I can reproduce an issue with a lot less effort uh, for, for me, at least personally. So I, I wouldn't mind seeing a similar system, probably not with the direct manipulation of the Docker Compose files or something. Uh, we just have two agents that we spin up once and leave around for a while, and then just make sure that the test scenario setup and cleanup is sufficient to cover as much as we we can quickly uh, with an integration test setup. Uh, and I, I don't think that would eliminate the need for um, changing the various configuration parameters that uh, get tested through the the current integration tests. Uh, also doesn't really eliminate the need for the Aries agent test harness, uh, but it could give us a, something that's a little bit easier to iterate on um, and, and uh, run through scenarios a little bit more fluidly, I guess. Yeah, I think it could be another tool, integration testing tool, like maybe it should get adopted by uh, Hyperledger. Yeah. Yeah, I wouldn't mind that. Um, I can raise some additional discussion on that on, on the issue and we can see what comes up from that, I guess. Okay. Um, there was another issue that Maurice raised um, with a number of, of suggestions for a 1.0 release. I think it was on the preparing the 1.0 release. Um, there it is. So Python 3.12 as uh, an upgrade for the 1.0 release, going through fixing uh, to-dos, Skipped tests. I think the skipped tests, a lot of them that he's referring to, I, I think are actually indie related tests. So those should be eliminated with the next PR that I've put together for dropping the indie SDK. Um, and then some some rough linting rules. Uh, I, I, I'm not opposed to the, the Python 3.12 upgrade, but I, I was curious, Wade, if you had um, uh, opinions in terms of pushing for moving to 3.12. I was kind of content to stay on 3.9 for a while longer, personally. Um, 3.9 is, in my brain, still relatively recent, good enough, so to speak. I just thought it was interesting. I mean, if if we can upgrade to, if we can upgrade to 3.12 and it's passing all the tests and there aren't any issues with it, then I don't see any reason why we wouldn't do that because it gives us a little bit longer to work on things. Yeah. Um, but obviously if we find issues with it, then we should stick with what we got. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I think there's, uh, Akapai is more of an application than it is a library. So, um, like the library, the Python support that we select has a little bit less of an impact, uh, like downstream from us, but there, uh, we do have some downstream in the form of the plugins. Um, and I think there's likely to be a, a small cascade of changes that would be required. 
uh, for Python 3.12 update, mostly in things like the AIO HTTP API spec stuff that we saw from Maritz earlier. Um, I think there's going to be similar updates in that same vein for um, some of our plugins. So it, it, yeah, it might be an interesting step for us to uh, release like a Python 3.12 image, maybe do some testing from there, Let's see how it goes with, with the integration into some of the plugins. Yeah, I mean, we could always do a PR for a, a Python 3.12 version and then uh, build an, a pre-release image off of that and yeah, see how that goes. Keep it separate for now. Yeah. Cool. Um, there is another issue that Patrick opened on the subject of major releases in in to Akpai. Um Did I? Yeah, this one back a little bit. So this is looking beyond 1.0, I guess. So there's that. Yeah. Um I didn't take into consideration here the data integrity attachment. Uh, you mentioned there was a PR for a new data integrity attachment. Uh, so I'd have to look at there, but yeah, this is what sort of my idea of what would be included in 2.0. And I wanted, the goal of this was for to see if uh, I was on the right track, at least in my mind model of the evolution of Icapai. Yeah. So there are Gitcom v2 efforts underway. Uh, VC data model 2.0 plus data integrity proofs. So we do have the attachment format that has been merged. Um, last I, I briefly checked in on that implementation, it was um, specific to issuance and presentation of anoncreds credentials with data yeah. integrity proofs at that point. So there's going to be some work yeah, yeah, I I I wanted to discuss this the, the last time, but I couldn't make the meeting. And so there was like a suggestion, like an RVC suggestion to supersede the, the previous one. And I had some uh, some concerns regarding to that for, for this reason. It was really catered towards uh, anon creds. Yeah. Uh, and I would really like to see a bit of a broader data integrity inclusion and anon creds being like one crypto suite that you can use. Yeah, yeah indeed. Uh, the attachment format itself, um, I think did uh, a pretty good job of accounting for the usage of other crypto suites outside of anon creds. Um, uh, but the implementation that we have so far is specific to anon creds. So it, exercising it a little bit further and um, getting an, an implementation that is capable of transferring, um, you know, standard. Yeah. Uh, you know, standard is maybe a bit of an inappropriate term to use, but other signature types um, for sure. Yeah. And there's like more details about it, like for the data model 2.0, like how will it be embedded in the code, you know, when it comes to validating the the schema and the models. Um, yeah. So I, I am personally not super familiar with the 2.0 data model and the, the differences between it and the 1.0 or 1.1. There's not, there's not much. There's not much. Barely anything. Yeah. Okay. Um, out of curiosity, since you seem to be much more in tune with that ecosystem than I am, um, what is the rate of adoption looking like for 2.0 versus 1.1 or 1.0? Uh, well, I've been seeing it a lot come up in requirements for newer efforts. Uh, like it's in the candidate recommendation phase. So now they want to get adoption, right? They want to have implementations using it. Uh, so it's not pressing, but has people want to participate in newer initiatives? It's a re it's a recommend, it's a requirement, right? So yeah, I think it would be important to have 
for the issuance and the verification. And it's not much. It's just need to be able to clearly distinguish between 1.1 and 2.0. Like if we're going to reuse the, like when I think about the link, uh, you know, the, the link data VC manager, you know, are, are we going to want to use this as well? Or are we going to create a new way to validate, you know, the, the payload that you send, whether that's to the issue credential V2 or, you know, VC API endpoints or the new Didcom V2 endpoints. Yeah. Um, a bit of a design, because like a lot of the code is like reused for multiple different modules. And while that's a good thing, there's also like, there's advantage and disadvantage for this. So Yeah. For sure. Just to make a plan for this. And then, yeah, for Anon Creds V2, you know, and this is keeping in mind that a Akapai 2.0 release will be like in a long time. You know, is it reasonable to expect that Anon Creds V2 would become to fruition by then? Uh, I don't know. Same thing for right. MDoc and MDL. Uh, right. Yeah. Um, okay, we've run out of time for this meeting already. Um, uh, thank you everyone for your participation. Thank you for uh, being willing to discuss issues and, and pull requests here. Um, that's been helpful for, for me at least. Hopefully it's been helpful for you guys to stay on top of what's going on inside of Akapai. Um, with that, we'll say goodbye to everyone and see you all uh, in two weeks or next week at the maintainers call. Thank you. <laughs>